Now, going on, he says in verse 20 of Daniel 10, Do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. In other words, the battle isn't over yet. And when I've gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. That's the next major Gentile empire. And you can understand, behind the history of these human empires, there are satanic forces at work that really are the explanation of what happens. You really cannot fully understand human history if you only look on the horizontal human level. Because the real forces that determine the destinies of nations and people are in the heavens. And then he says, verse 12, verse 21 of Daniel chapter 10, and I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince, again, the archangel Michael. Then you go on to the first verse of the next chapter, which is part of the same message. Also in the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. There's a clear example of the intervention of angels in human history. Why did God's angel stand up for Darius? The answer is because God's people Israel had been captured and enslaved by the empire of Babylon. And Darius was the ruler of the Persian empire that destroyed the empire of Babylon and released God's people to return to their land, which was God's purpose. So behind all the human forces and the horizontal plane, there is a vertical plane and there are angelic forces, both angels of God and angels of Satan, that are at work. And human history is to be explained by the interplay of all these forces. Now, why we are significant as Christians is because God has given to us and us alone the weapons by which we can intervene in this spiritual war. Governments have armies and weapons that will deal with other nations, but only the Christian church has the weapons that will intervene in the spiritual realm in the heavenlies. And you understand the one who wins in the heavenlies ultimately determines the course of history. So the most significant thing you can do in history, in a sense, is be an intercessor and pray through the spiritual issues in the heavenlies that will determine the history of nations on earth. See, Daniel is a, just a perfect example. Now, as I've said already, we are involved in this war. That's not an option. The only decision you can make is whether you'll be part of the kingdom of God or not. If you're part of the kingdom of God, you are at war with the kingdom of Satan. That's not something you can decide. You just better get equipped and learn how to fight because if you don't, you're going to be a casualty. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Jesus, uh, Paul says there's going to come an evil day. An evil day comes in the light of every one of us. Whether we stand or not depends on whether we've got the equipment that we need. And then Paul lists the armor and it's taken from the battle armor of a Roman legionary in his day. This is the picture. There are six main items of armor which we look at very quickly. We're not going to comment on them. Stand there, therefore, having your waist girded with truth. You have a belt that you wear around your waist and it's truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, you have a protection over your chest which protects your heart and it's righteousness. Not the righteousness of works but the righteousness of faith. And then it says, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You have sandals that protect your feet and enable you to march far and fast, which Roman legionaries could do. What's the protection of your feet? It's the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, or over everything else, taking the shield of faith. 
This is a great big shield shaped like a door which could protect every part of your person from the arrows of the enemy. And then it says, take the helmet of salvation. What part of you does your helmet protect? Your head. What does your head stand for? Your thought life, that's right. And it is so important we know how to protect our thought life. God has provided a helmet. Here it's called the helmet of salvation. In 1 Thessalonians 5.8 it's called a, the helmet and for a helmet the hope of salvation. You know what protects your mind? Hope. You've got to be an optimist. If you're a pessimist, your mind is open to the attacks of Satan. I was born and brought up a pessimist and I suffered agonies in my mind until I learned I had to change and that I had a helmet that would protect my mind. All right, take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the spoken Word of God. Notice you've got six items of equipment. All of them are defensive except the last one, the sword, which is a weapon of attack but only goes as far as your arm can reach. But the seventh weapon is the weapon, and it's in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Here is where we can reach out and assail Satan's kingdom in the heavens. It's with the weapon of prayer in the Spirit. So we have seven items of equipment. Five are defensive. The sixth is the sword, which you only reach as far as your arm reaches. But the seventh is what I call God's intercontinental ballistic missile. What is it? All prayer. We can assail Satan's kingdom with the weapon of all prayer. All right, now I'm coming to the very thing that I wanted to deal with. I'm going to go back to Matthew 12 and I'm going to show you one more verse. And really all I can do is stimulate your thinking. But that's a lot. If the church would only start thinking, we'd be undefeatable. It always impresses me that Martin Luther started the Protestant Reformation by pinning up 90-some theses. He didn't pin up the answers, he just got them started thinking. And when they started thinking, things change, see? It's important that we learn to think. All right, now we read in Matthew 12 about Jesus' answer about the two kingdoms. The next verse is very important, it says, verse 29, or else how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, then he will plunder the house. Now this is in connection with the warfare of the kingdoms. It's what I call the principle of the strong man. Jesus pictures a house with a strong man, a despot, a cruel ruler, who has in his house slaves, all sorts of stolen goods, but he's got everything under his control and it's very difficult to go in and set his slaves free or steal, get back his plunder. If you go in, all the time you're trying to free his slaves, you're fighting off the strong man, see? And you may end up wounded. So Jesus says, that's not the logical way to do it. The logical way is to begin by binding the strong man. Tie him up, put a gag in his mouth, then you can walk in and out at liberty and help yourself to what you need and set his captives free. Now this is a spiritual principle. If you want to be successful in any given situation, you've got to discover who is the satanic strong man over the situation? Then you've got to bind the strong man. Then you can do what needs to be done in the situation. But the principle is first bind the strong man, then set his captives free. Now, as I said, Satan's kingdom descends from area, from level to level with, pe with persons, angelic beings, with areas of responsibility and they come down, the lowest ones are pretty small areas. And generally speaking, you don't start at the top, you start where you are. And you learn the principles of warfare and then you can move on. 
until you're dealing with the strong man over a city or even over a nation, but you don't normally begin there. So, if you have problems in succeeding, in doing the will of God, in breaking through spiritually, maybe in your family, maybe in a business, maybe in a church, and somehow things are not going the way you feel they ought to go, but you don't understand the problem. My suggestion is, in all probability, there is a strong man over that situation. And you will not be really successful until you deal with the strong man. Jesus is speaking. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's a tremendous statement. The Greek actually says, whatever you bind on earth will be having been bound in heaven. So the moment you bind it on earth, it's bound in heaven, you see? We have the power to intervene in the heavenly realm. If we meet the conditions on earth, we can bind something on earth which is bound in heaven. Or whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. If a, a group of persons, a family, a community, even a nation are bound by certain spiritual forces. If we meet the conditions on earth, we can loose them and what we loose on earth shall be having been loosed in heaven. In other words, Jesus says, you bind it on earth and when you look around, it's bound in heaven. See, in a way, we're not waiting for God. God is waiting for us.